Hi everyone, my name is Eric Mitra. I'm a nuclear medicine physician at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. I'm very happy to be participating in this patient conference and my topic is on understanding PRRT. So big thanks to the organizers for having me here and let's go ahead and dive in. So these are my disclosures. And the outline of the talk is as follows. Um, I know there's uh, a variety of different people that are listening to this lecture. So we'll start right at the beginning and go over background of what PRRT is. We'll very quickly kind of review some of the key literature and guidelines that are currently in existence for PRRT as well as the current practice of PRRT. But the real focus of this presentation will be the second half, which is focused on the future directions of PRRT. So to start at the beginning, so that we're all on the same page, PRRT stands for Peptide Receptor Radionuclide Therapy. And you can see the chemical structure on the right of your screen, and on the left is the general schematic for a lot of radiopharmaceuticals that we use. And this is exactly the same concept where the radioisotope is attached to a chelator or a linker, and then that is attached to the peptide, which actually binds in this case to the somatostatin receptors on the tumor cells, thereby bringing the radionuclide to the tumor and allowing it to have the therapeutic effect that it does. Currently, there's only one FDA-approved version of PRRT, which is the lutetium-177 dotatate, or brand name Lutathera. The mechanism of action of many of our radiopharmaceuticals for different types of therapies, but certainly for uh, neuroendocrine tumors is shown here, which it's administered intravenously, then circulates throughout the body, and then homes in on the tumor cells because of the expression of somatostatin receptors on the center of the cell, you can see there in the screen. It's then internalized into the cell, and then that radiation from the lutetium-177 is given off, which causes DNA damage and eventually stops the cell from continuing to grow. The label that was approved for Lutathera is relatively broad, actually. It indicates that there has to be expression, again, of the somatostatin receptors, which is the target for this therapy. And it's allowed to be used throughout patients who have gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, including of the foregut, midgut, or hindgut. It doesn't specify other things beyond that in great detail, which is actually a good thing. In the bottom of this slide, you'll see the pathologic classification of neuroendocrine tumors. And the thing to really focus on is that this treatment is primarily for those patients who have well-differentiated, low-intermediate, and more and more high-grade tumors are uh, being included in this as well. And we'll see some of the uh, advancing research on that. The low, intermediate, or high is differentiated primarily by the mitotic index or the P67 index, which is a proliferation marker. Anything less than three is low grade, three to 20% is intermediate, and above 20% is considered high grade. But again, the thing to really focus on is that this treatment is only for those that are well differentiated and not for those that are poorly differentiated, which are considered neuroendocrine carcinomas. The primary study, the phase three study that led to the approval of Lutathera was this one called the Netter-1 study, uh, which was published in 2017. And the primary endpoint was progression-free survival, and, which is shown on the left. And you can see that it was a dramatically in favor of lutetium-177 dotatate over the control arm, which was high-dose octreotide. So much improved progression-free survival or delay in advancement of the tumors using the PRT as opposed to using octreotide. The right side is also important, which shows the tumor shrinkage. And it shows that PRT was statistically more effective in causing tumor shrinkage than the high-dose octreotide. However, only 13% of patients actually experienced that. So the vast majority of patients are actually just experiencing tumor control in terms of preventing the tumors from continuing to grow, but not necessarily causing it to shrink down, which is an important thing to keep in mind with this therapy. Since that initial publication in 2017, there have been a number of important additional publications related to the Netter-1 study. For instance, in 2018 was publication of the quality of life. Uh, which showed that across the board, there was an improvement in various types of symptoms associated with this disease as a result of using PRRT. 
And more recently in 2021 was the publication of the final overall survival results. And the curves here you can see are much closer together than the progression-free survival data that we just looked at. So this is not statistically significant, but there was a clinical significance to this because patients receiving PRRT did have an increase in overall survival of almost one year, which is you know, thought to be relatively significant clinically. And then I just want to quickly mention that PRRT is at this point widely accepted throughout many types of guidelines that are used throughout various societies. One of the most important ones is the NCCN guidelines or the National Comprehensive Cancer Network which identifies you know, what types of treatments are generally considered appropriate for different types of cancers. And it's widely throughout the NCCN guidelines. So here it's for well-differentiated GI, lung, and thymic neuroendocrine tumors. It's also listed within the guidelines for pancreas. It's even listed within the guidelines for well-differentiated grade three, so K67 over 20% neuroendocrine tumors. As I mentioned, that's kind of an evolving area, but it is within the guidelines. And it's even listed within the guidelines for furchromocytoma and paraganglioma. So really widely accepted within the NCCN. There are also various consensus statements and appropriate use criteria, such as this one, which is jointly from the North American Neuroendocrine Tumor Society, NANETS, and the Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging, SNMMI. This was from 2018. There have also been additional practice parameters from a wide variety of different uh, societies. For instance, this is a combination of multiple different radiology and radiation oncology societies which have come together uh, in terms of the proper practice of this type of therapy. And lastly, I want to point out that the Nanets Guidelines Committee recently also published the guidelines for G3, well-differentiated tumors specifically. And here in the center, you can see that for those that are well-differentiated pancreatic or GI G3 neuroendocrine tumors, it is also within the guidelines. Then on the very right are the poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas, which again, this would not be appropriate for that. Okay, so to move forward into some of the more practicalities of doing this treatment, first and foremost, we have to use molecular imaging to be able to identify the somatostatin receptor target. Here you can see the wide variety of different agents that are available. The majority of these are targeting somatostatin receptors, and the majority of them are PET imaging agents. But the very one at the bottom, FDG, is a general PET imaging agent for all different types of cancer, which also does have a role. But the most common ones are highlighted there in yellow, which are two different isotope versions of dotatate, which is either labeled with gallium-68 or copper-64, and then also the F18-FDG. So the most important way we use this in terms of the therapy is to identify the somatostatin receptors are expressed appropriately across all the different tumor sites. So here you can see before doing PRRT, it's used to identify that in this particular patient. We look for high expression above the liver background, and that would indicate that the patient has sufficient expression and should do well with the therapy and have sort of a response. And then the other way we can use it is after PRRT to reassess the disease and look at how much of a response there has been, but also just to kind of reestablish where the disease is now located after the treatment is done, which can then guide subsequent therapies in the future. Um, I mentioned that FDG does have a role, and the main use for it here is, again, related to that key 67 or proliferation index. As the tumor becomes higher grade, it tends to lose somatostatin receptor expression, but have FDG uptake in the tumors instead. This is one example from the literature showing that even in the same patient, you can have certain areas which have high somatostatin receptor expression and low FDG uptake, but in other areas, you have the reverse. And until you do both types of scans, you wouldn't necessarily know that each type of thing exists. And that, of course, would affect the results of the PRT because those areas that don't have high SSTR expression wouldn't be expected to respond well to the treatment. So the important thing is that there's a wide overlap of those patients who should be imaged with the dotatate versus those who should be imaged with FDG. And in that middle range of K67, 10 to 55%, you might actually need to do both types of scans to get a full appreciation of the degree of tumor. So to summarize what we're currently doing, 
this was FDA approved in January 2018 for patients with, who are expressing somatostatin receptor positive neuroendocrine tumors, and it's typically currently used as second or third line uh, for these patients who have metastatic disease, it's inoperable gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and the first line treatment is typically surgery and or somatostatin receptor analogs without the radio pharmaceutical attached. And the way we do this specifically is always in the context of a multidisciplinary tumor board to look at some of the parameters that we've been talking about in terms of the subtype and grade of neuroendocrine tumors, the imaging characteristics, we discuss what uh, type of symptoms and other medical conditions the patient has, what are the therapeutic options they have, and of course, to make sure that the labs are sufficiently high enough to be able to tolerate some degree of toxicity from the radiopharmaceutical administration, which should recover at the time of the next cycle of treatment. So the complete therapy is typically done as four cycles of 200 millicuries given every two months, and it can be given in addition to the long-acting atriotide, which is primarily used for symptom control. And as long as the labs are sufficient throughout this time, then we can complete all four cycles of treatment. So that's the current treatment regimen as it's given now. Another way to look at that is shown here. So we're using lutetium-177 dotatate, 200 millicuries given intravenously for four cycles as a second line or third line treatment and for those patients with gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. When we look at the future of PRRT, which is what we'll focus on for the remainder of this talk, interestingly, every single aspect of this treatment is being looked at as a form of improvement in the future. So the isotope itself is being looked at, the peptide dotatate is being looked at, the dosing of 200 millicuries, the administration route intravenously, the number of cycles of administration, and the fact that this is second line treatment. All of those are being looked at in various clinical trials to help improve this for the future. And even the indication of all differentiated grade one or grade two gastroenteropancreatic endocrine tumors may well change in the future. So let's look at each of these in a little bit more detail. The first one I really wanna focus on is this aspect of the radioisotope itself. So again, what the only one that's approved right now is lutetium-177, which is a beta minus emitter, but there have been other uh, isotopes looked at in the past, including yttrium-90 and indium-111. In the future, though, the biggest area of excitement is with alpha therapies, such as actinium-225 or lead-212. The basic concept behind alpha versus beta is that these are much larger particles, actually 8,000 times the mass of a beta particle, as a result of it being so much larger, it can potentially be much more effective because it's causing more DNA damage within, once within the cell. And additionally, because it's so large, it doesn't travel very far in tissue and that shorter range might lead to less toxicity to the surrounding bone marrow or other organs as an example. So these are at least in theory why there's so much excitement about it. There's actually three ongoing clinical trials right now with alpha dotatate therapies for neuroendocrine tumors. You can see these listed here. The first one at the top is by a company called Raise Bio, which is looking at this in patients who have already progressed using standard lutetium therapy. And then the other two are actually with a lead. And in one case, it's looking at patients who haven't been treated with PRT and those also that have previously been treated with PRT. So these are all recruiting right now in uh, generally the phase two to three range of a clinical trial. And so we uh, expect some uh, you know, very exciting results from these in the future. Some of the preliminary data that's come out of these trials already, such as this example with the lead compound mentioned in the middle on the prior slide is showing some dramatic results. But of course, these really need to be evaluated fully in the phase two and phase three trials because before we can really trust the results so uh, I wouldn't put too much emphasis on it currently, but there certainly is a lot of excitement around it as well. Some of the other uh, important trials that are ongoing, this is a company called ITM, which has the Dota Talk compound that I mentioned briefly on the molecular imaging slide. It's also labeled with lutetium-177. The other name for it is etotriotide. It is felt to be very similar to dotatate, so it's probably gonna have a very similar efficacy and toxicity profile, 
But again, the final results uh, have yet to be seen. So this is one trial we're waiting for. And there are also other peptides which are actually antagonists to the somatostatin receptor and can therefore bind the tumor more strongly. These are also being evaluated in clinical trials, both for imaging and therapy. The dosing and number of cycles for this treatment is currently limited to 200 millicuries every four cycles. If anything, we can only reduce it by half to 100 millicuries if there's been toxicity. But in the future, there's many other ways we can look at using this to expand the number of cycles or to expand the total dose that's given. The most obvious way to do that is to repeat PRRT for those patients who had effective tumor control the first time around. And so that's being done clinically in in many sites as well as through clinical trials. Uh, We can try to personalize the dose using dosimetry, using a variety of different approaches. Unfortunately, right now, this is still very much in in the research realm, but we're beginning to use it clinically. And then you can even do interesting things like an induction and maintenance therapy, which are looked at in um, certain trials as well. The administration route is currently limited to intravenous, but there has been some work done to look at interarterial administration for patients who primarily have liver dominant disease. The results from these preliminary studies are currently mixed, but the final results are still pending. And probably the biggest area that might be of interest in the future is sequencing and combination. So currently, again, we're using it as second or third line and typically as monotherapy, meaning we just use it alone. The only addition we sometimes do is the addition of somatostatin analogs. But in the future, we can first of all begin to use this earlier on. And there was an important study that was just recently, we have the preliminary abstract information, which is from the Netter 2 study. This is the um, algorithm for the Netter 2 study that was recently published in preliminary form at the um, American Society of Clinical Oncology. And what it's showing is that this was studied in patients who have not previously been exposed to PRRT or any type of systemic therapy was required. And they were actually just initially diagnosed within six months prior to enrollment. So very early on, and it's again comparing lutetium dotatate to high-dose octreotide, similar to what Netter 1 did. And here again, the results were quite significant to show that the PRRT versus the high-dose octreotide arm was significantly in favor of PRRT for the primary endpoint of PFS. So showing that in this kind of first-line therapy, it it can be very effective, and this was just recently published. The final data is yet to come. Some of the other areas are combination therapies with other systemic agents, which are also known to have a good effect. So if you can combine the effect of PRT plus the effect of those systemic therapies, then you can potentially improve the outcomes even further. The combination and sequencing with liver-directed therapies is being evaluated because that's still a little bit unknown in terms of which one should happen first or second. And similarly for external beam radiation, although that typically has a more limited role for neuroendocrine tumors. So in summary, lutetium dotatate was FDA approved in January 2018, but now is used widely in over 200 centers within the U.S. There are multiple publications and guidelines to support its use as standard of care therapy. Having said that, that way we're using it now, I believe, is just a start. And in the future, as we discussed, there's so many different ongoing trials to look at a variety of different ways that we can continue to improve PRRT in the future all for the improvement uh, of outcomes and reducing toxicity for neuroendocrine tumors. So with that, I will stop and thank you very much for your attention.